but this will be the third installment. We're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through uh, 30, well, 24 through through 30, and then we'll jump over to ch verse 36 and read through uh, verse 43. All right. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skipping down to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, we just thank you, Lord, once again for your word, and I pray that you would help me, Lord, to bring forth this message that you've placed on my heart, Lord. I pray that you'd give us revelation as we speak yes. your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Does anybody uh, remember off the top of their head what the word parable actually means? Anybody remember? I'm going to write it, so if you don't, it's fine. So the word parable, because this is definitely a teaching, so hopefully you'll be okay with that. The word parable, we get this word from this Greek word. That's important that you remember this for we're going through the Bible kind of like a book by book. We do that every year. That's how I feel like the Lord wants me to teach the Bible. And so on Wednesday nights, when we get to the book of Proverbs, it's going to be kind of important that you at least have a little bit of an understanding of this concept because the Proverbs are written this way. So this word is a compound word in the Greek, parabolo. You don't have to really know that. What you need to know is this. That this word here means side. Does anybody remember what this word means? Along. It's where we get the word ball, but it means throw. So what's happening is, is that two things are being thrown alongside one another, right? And what's being thrown alongside one another is something that is known versus something that is unknown. Now, when, if you'll remember, and, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but Jesus purposefully started teaching in parables Whenever the Pharisees called into question his ministry. Remember that? He, he, he cast a devil out of someone and they accused him of using the power of Satan. And whenever they did that, Jesus began to teach in parables. Not that he had never taught before, but this became, th th there's this long string of teaching that takes place. And there was a reason that he did that. This may be somewhat offensive to some people, but it's real clear when you read the beginning of Matthew chapter 13 that, there, that Matthew says this was a fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah had said. The prophet Isaiah, whenever uh, the year King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord seated on the throne. That's in the Old Testament. And what happened was, was that the, the presence of God overtook him. And the end result was that God asked the question, whom shall I send? In other words, who is going to go for me and do the work that I've called him to do? Isaiah said, send me, Lord, I'll do it. And so then what the Lord told Isaiah was, I want you to go and to basically, I'm paraphrasing, preach my word 
until their hearts become fat. He said their ears are going to hear, but they're not really going to receive. Their eyes are going to see, but they're not really going to perceive. I want you to preach the word of God until their hearts become fat. I used this analogy before. The idea of fat there has to do kind of like bacon grease in a pan. You know how it gets congealed and hard? The idea is that it prevents the seed from getting into the soil. So, so what happens is, is that many times people are exposed to the scripture and they harden their hearts towards it. And whenever you harden your heart towards the truth of God's word, it just it, it becomes worse. Right. And that's what's happening. That's the whole purpose of this, that there's a multitude of people now that are flocking to Jesus's ministry. But the reality is, is that not all of them have right motives. Not all of them have right motives and Jesus begins to purposely teach in parables. And as you see, he goes into the house in this story here and the disciples say, okay, now tell us the parable of the tares. And Jesus begins to explain to them that essentially what he's talking about is the world. And it's talking about the fact that the, that the good, that the man who owns the property is the son of man. That's him. And that he is sowing good seed into a field, and the field is the world. The world that we live in is a field. It's a, it's a harvest field. The, the scripture is full of the thought that, that God is looking for a harvest, and we've preached that before. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom of God, but then an enemy, which is the devil, comes. While the men were asleep, by the way. You know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm just going to go ahead and say, because this is the time to say it. In, if we remember the disciples, what happened to them whenever Jesus got betrayed? They fell asleep. Right there at the light. Jesus says, can't you just tarry just for a moment? In other words, can't you stay awake? Can't you persevere just for a moment? He says, it's okay. The Son of Man has been betrayed into the hands of sinners. In other words, it's too late now. You, you know, and he had to wake them up on more than one occasion. There's other scriptures in the New Testament that talk about the fact that we aren't of the night. We aren't of the darkness. Therefore, we should remain awake. We should remain sober because there's a work to be done. Amen. And so, but the servants of this man who owned this field fell asleep. And when they fell asleep is when the enemy came in and sowed the bad seed, the tares. And, and, and in the end, so, so what they said was, is that well, when we see the tares, what shall we do? Shall we go to pluck them out? In other words, you weed your garden, right? So you would think the right thing to do when you see a weed growing amongst something, uh, amongst the wheat that you would know. Jesus says, no, you don't do that. You let them grow together. And in the end, when it's harvest time, then I'm going to distinguish between the two and I'm going to take care of it. We talked last time about the, uh, the other parable, which had to do with the parable of the sower. You remember that? And the parable of the sower, the known thing was that seed has certain responses to certain types of soil. That's in a literal sense, right? Seed, depending on the soil that it falls on, has a specific type of response. The unknown part of that parable was the fact that the seed represented God's word and the soil represented the heart of man. You remember that? We talked about the wayside. Do you remember what the wayside was? You might not, but I'm going to tell you. It was a well-trodden path. It's not the place where the seed was really typically supposed to be sown. It's a place where the man would have walked, but he's slinging so much seed that seed's falling down on the wayside. But what it represents is a hard and trodden path. In other words, it's untilled soil. I don't, I don't like to garden personally. I know that there's people in here that do, and I sure do like eating your, your tomatoes. But what I'm going to say is this. You're supposed to properly till soil, breaking up fallow ground. That, that's an Old Testament Bible word. Fallow means hardened. It's, it's, it's ground that's been trampled and hardened. You're supposed to break that up for it to be receptive to seed. So the seed that was sown by the wayside represents hardened hearts. It represents unrepentant, hardened hearts that are hard towards the word of God. Now what happens is that whenever the seed falls on the wayside, on the hardened ground that hasn't been tilled, that hasn't been softened by the word of God, that hasn't been receptive to the word of God, then the fowl of the air, which is the enemy, comes and steals the seed. Remember that? Jesus said the fowl of the air represents the devil. He comes and steals the word of God immediately. So there's a lot of people that are hardened towards the thing of God, things of God. And even though they hear the word of God, 
their heart really is unreceptive to it. It just lies dormant, and the enemy comes and immediately steals that word. The second thing was stony ground. We're moving through this fast. It prevents the seed. You remember, there, Israel has a lot of different types of soil, and many times, even in Ireland also, I know that they have a lot of rocks in the soil. Rocks have to be removed. Specifically, if you don't get rid of the rocks, what happens is the root can't get down in the soil. And so what this represents is that someone who may hear the word of God and respond quickly. Oh, man, that sounds good. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. Right. But because there's no depth there, it springs up quickly. But then when the sun comes out, it scorches it, it withers away and it dies. What Jesus said was this is that, yes, they receive the word of God at first with joy, but they don't really allow depth to take place in their walk. This represents the person that has not really taken upon themselves the reality that it's important to study the Word of God, to learn the Word of God so that they can learn the character of God, so that they can build a relationship with God. It's kind of like, you know, churches are filled with people that are like, feed me, preacher. I remember one time, you know, John Hagee, this just popped in my brain. I used to listen to John Hagee. I don't really listen to, to him anymore, but I can remember he was preaching one time and he told his congregation this. Now, I would never say this because I can never get away with it, uh, but I wouldn't. I don't know that I'd really want to say it. But anyway, I don't know. He had thousands of people in his church, tens of thousands of people. In his church. And this is what he told him. And when he said it, they all started clapping and shouting for him. He said, you people are like a bunch of 300 pound whales. You sit in the, in the pew and you scream, feed me, feed me, feed me. But you don't want to do anything for the Lord. The truth of the matter is, and the people loved it. Don't, don't ask me. I don't know. But they, 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 you can hear them clapping in the background. The point is, is this, is that there are people that sit in churches and they kind of just say, and preacher, feed me. And they're not really necessarily wanting to do any work for themselves. You understand what I'm saying? You do realize that there's homework in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, I'm not talking about a works-based Christianity here. I'm not talking about the fact that you can study enough or read enough or work hard enough in order to attain some type of favor with God. What I'm talking about is if you're going to learn the word of God, that there is some work involved. You're going to have to put your eyes on the text and read it for yourself. You're going to have to take some notes. You're going to have to study the Bible. Does that make sense? That's when it comes to depth. Listen, Jesus said it. Paul said it. James said it. Trials produce Trials are like fertilizer for faith. Trials cause the believer to learn the concept of endurance. But for a person that has no root in them, the trial, because that's what Jesus said that when he interpreted the parable, he said that the son was like a trial. Persecution that comes in a person's life because of the faith. And what ends up happening is, is that when they receive persecution because of the faith, because they have no depth, because they have no root, they're like, man, I don't like adversity. I don't, I don't want to be made fun of because of my faith. Oh, man, I'm not about this, right? And so the next thing you know, they begin to wither away. Thorns were the third type of soil. Just as there are two kingdoms competing for souls, the kingdom of light and darkness, there's also two messages competing for man's loyalty. Trust in God versus trust in the world. You know, people are consumed with the cares of the world. I know you know that, right? How will I pay my bills? We're consumed. I say we. I'm going to put myself in that plural pronoun. We, we, we question various things. How will I pay my bills? How will I take care of my family? How will I find the right person? What about all my friends? All these thoughts that run through people's minds. And if it's not that, then there are many people who are consumed with riches. One thing that I have learned a little bit in this life is this, is that the more money you make, sometimes the more money you want. Jesus said that it's harder for a man to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. Why is that? He explained it because people begin to trust in their riches. They trust in their success. Now, this, can, this is a believer right here. Because see, in the parable, the thorn grows alongside the seed of God's word. They grow together just as God placed the tree in the midst of the garden. He put, it, he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right next to the tree of life. He didn't take it out. He, he doesn't say that the thorns are removed. No, the cares of this life remain here. 
And if we're not careful, what will happen is they will begin to grow alongside and tangle around the seed of God's word and begin to choke it. The word means suffocate. That's right. That's, that, that's got to be a horrible way to die, wouldn't you think? Suffocation. I mean, I can think of a whole lot better ways. Not, I'm not saying I want to die, but I, <laughs> but I can think of a whole lot better ways to die than to be suffocated. Right? But that's what happens is that it's a slow, insidious process where the word of God is suffocated or choked because of the cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches. Deceitfulness of riches. You know what that tells me is, and I, after this I, I really need to move on, but it tells me that a lot of folks started off in the faith and they didn't realize that the riches were going to get them. You see what I'm saying? Like they didn't think that the riches were going to cause them problems. They were probably skating along doing fine for quite some time. But after a period of time, the <coughs> riches, their desire to trust in their riches, to trust in their successes rather than to trust in the Lord began to choke out the cares of the world and the riches choked out the word of God. The, third, the fourth type of soil was good soil. And ultimately, the good soil produced fruit for God's kingdom. You know, I don't mean to be a negative preacher and I don't want to be, but in this parable, if you'll notice, there were four types of soil and three of them were negative. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you would realize if you really do a deep study of these parables is that Jesus is starting to introduce some negativity about the kingdom. He's starting to make people aware because, listen, what's happening is he's coming off the cusp of these Pharisees accusing him of of working under the under the power of Satan and that there's these crowds of people, but all of them aren't true believers or followers of the Lord. And this is where he comes with this, with the, with the concept of the tares amongst the wheat. So the known truth then in the last one had to do with the soil and the seed and that the seed was God's word and that the soil was the heart of man. And the known truth here is that literal tares grow sometimes in the field of wheat. That's the literal truth. But the unknown truth is that the poisonous weed that looks, it looks like weed at first. That's what I want you to know. A tear is like a weed, but it, more than that, it's a poisonous weed. And, and, and in addition to that, it looks just like weed at first. I'm telling you, from what I, uh, the research I've done in the past, it's like you can't even tell the difference between the two until it's harvest time. Then the wheat starts to look more like wheat. And the tear shows itself. It doesn't have the fruit on it like the wheat does. All right. So literal tears grow amongst literal wheat. But the unknown concept is that that the disciples didn't know is that, hey, <clears throat> in my kingdom, there's going to be people that look like wheat, mm -hmm. but they're really tears. That's right. And. Unlike a literal tear that you would go and you'd pull it out because it's poisonous and you don't want to eat it. Jesus said, you don't do that with these. Instead, you like let them all grow together. Amen. Now, now don't get over here and allow the enemy to whisper in your ear. He's calling you a tear. <laughs> I don't think that anybody in this church is necessarily a tear, right? I, I mean, any more than I am. But the truth of the matter is, is that there are tears in the kingdom of God and there are tears in the church. Right. It's not my job. I do want to say this. It's not my job nor your job to figure out who the tears are. And we're not supposed to go around trying to pull them out. The parable begins the thought that causes us to pause and realize that not everything that calls itself Christian is really Christian. Not everyone who goes to church is truly born again. I'm really going to talk a good bit about that today. Uh, Paul uses his Jewish brothers to describe this thought. Now, I almost got rid of this particular passages of Scripture, but I, I'm glad I didn't because I think it's good. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. I'm using this strictly as an illustration. Paul talks about Jewish people. And how just because they call themselves Jews, it doesn't make them a Jew. And I'm using that as an illustration to say just because somebody calls himself a Christian doesn't mean they're a Christian, right? I don't want you to get lost in the translation. It says, not as though the word of God has taken none effect. Here again is the truth that it's not God's word that's at fault here, right? 
He says, They are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Well, that's a lot of information. What does it mean? Well, let me just tell you this. Who is the children of the flesh? He's using this as an analogy to describe Ishmael. Y'all remember the sons of Abraham. The, the seed of Abraham are all those, the true seed of Abraham, according to the book of Galatians, teaches us that, all, that Abraham was the father of the faith. So everyone that would be true to the faith that God was providing mankind would be a child of Abraham, would be the seed of Abraham. But Abraham, for a period of time, lacked faith and trusted in flesh. All of us at some point in time in our life have done that. We've tried to make things happen in our own strength. Abraham did that whenever he produced Ishmael. The Bible says right here, Isaac was the promised seed. So there's a whole lot of people that were born Abraham's seed and even circumcised. Look, Ishmael was circumcised on the 13th day. I'm sorry. In his 13th year. Ishmael was circumcised at 13 years old. Isaac was circumcised on the eighth day. Point being is that Ishmael, I don't want to get into Islam, the Muslim religion, because that didn't come for another 2,000, 2,500 years later. You understand that, right? Muhammad was 600 AD. But there is a whole lineage of people that would be circumcised and even call themselves of the seed of Abraham. But Paul right here is saying no. Ishmael wasn't the promised seed. Isaac was the promised seed. You know, Israel is a nation like no other nation. What, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, Israel, God created that nation himself. You understand that? God created that nation himself, and it was a nation that was built on the word of God. But you can be born a Jew today, physically, and according to this next passage of scripture, Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, you could be born a Jew physically, but not be considered by God a Jew spiritually. Because you're not following after the faith. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? This is what it says right here. This is Paul saying it. Paul was a Jew. He says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So what is he saying there? He's saying that even though Jewish men may circumcise themselves outwardly, the New Testament conversion, when that takes place, a circumcision of the heart happens. It's a surgical procedure done by the Spirit of God that cuts away the flesh of man's heart and changes him internally. Does that make sense? It's not an outward thing that God's looking for. He's looking for an inward change. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It changes people on the inside. Amen. It does a work on their hearts. So just like Ishmael, Jewish men may be born Jews. They might be circumcised outwardly. <clears throat> they may dress like a Jew. They may uh, be born according to the natural uh, state of things as a Jew. However, a true Jew is one that has become a child of the promise, faith in Christ, resulting in a circumcision of the heart. Listen to me. I think I, this is a whole other story, and I probably shouldn't even get off on it, but I am for just one second. The, the fact of the matter is, is that there's a whole lot of people that are so focused on the current Jewish nation now, God doesn't even recognize. They may still be following Jewish traditions, but do you realize, I'm about to say it, that that religion is nothing different than paganism now. Amen. They're in disobedience to God. Amen. God's not done with the Jewish people. He's not done with the Jewish nation. There's Jews that are getting saved each and every day. But the book of Ephesians says that he made two men one. There were Jew, there was Gentile, but now there's only one in Christ Jesus who's been saved through the blood of the Lamb, and it's one spirit that has made him one man. But just as a Jew could be born nationalistically, if that even be a word, as a Jewish man, but not be one spiritually, same goes true for the tear. There's people that call themselves Christian. There's people that believe that they're born again. But the reality of it is, is that they're not truly born again. They're tears. Now, let's talk. Point number one is this. The effects of a tear. I put the word poisonous. 
There's two New Testament scriptures that talk about poison. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 14. Let's look at that one real quick. Because you see a tear, if you have a tear friend in your life, it can be poison to you. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's a fancy word for tomb. And their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps, that's a venomous snake, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now, what Paul's talking about here is that everybody is guilty. He's making the case that's why you need Jesus. Amen. And I have to tell you that that's one of the things that has to remain in the gospel in order for someone to truly get saved. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. you got to realize you're a sinner. If nobody's willing to ever preach the truth about sin, nobody's ever going to be able to be convicted by the Holy Spirit about what's going on in their life. And they're never going to be able to repent and put their faith in Christ and what he did for them on the cross in order to receive forgiveness of their sins. <laughs> Instead, they will sit in a, ch in a pew in a church and they, they will think that because they're doing their obligation that they're okay. No, everybody's guilty. But he's talking about the tongue. He, said, he says that the, the tongue can be poisonous. Look at this other scripture, James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. It says, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. The word for poison right there, I thought this was really interesting, can be used for both what we just talked about, the poisons of asps, which is a very venomous snake, and also rust. Hmm. Both of them cause destruction. One is more immediate the other one is slow and insidious. But both of these passages of Scripture talk about what comes out of somebody's mouth. Now, what I will tell you is this. I don't believe that everybody that's ever talked bad about somebody is necessarily a tear. Because if that's to be the truth, every last one of us in this room have failed the test, if we're honest with one another. But what I will tell you is this, is that sometimes people speak poison into your life. A tear will have be their poisonous. And they will speak poison into your life. They're not going to be true believers. It's not for you to decide. We haven't gotten there yet, but I'm here to tell you. It's not for you to decide whether or not they're a tear or not. That's up to the Lord. But at the same time, if they're speaking poison in your life, you might want to be careful around that because it can end up ultimately, like rust does to metal, cause destruction in your life. That was point number one. The effects of a tear. Point number two is how the tear got there. <clears throat> Just as God allowed Satan to test Job, God allows the enemy to plant tares in the field. He said it. I mean, it's like, Lord, why do you do this? Because he doesn't, he doesn't want us just trusting and believing, right, in our own selves and <clears throat> whatever the case. Stated earlier, we learned from this parable that everything that calls itself Christian isn't Christian. The first parable connected the word of God as seed and its result in good soil resulted in good growth and fruit. With that thought, it stands to reason that the enemy would use poisonous seed to plant poisonous tares. I know we talk about this a lot, but it's because God talks about it a lot. It's throughout the Old Testament. He said it through the prophet Jeremiah. The prophets lie and the people love it so. Can you imagine that? That God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah and he said, Tell, he said, the prophets are lying and my people love it when they lie to me. And the same thing happens today in the modern church. There's preachers all over the television that are telling lies and the people love it. It entertains their flesh and they say, Feed me more of this. But let's look at some concepts about false doctrine. We've used this scripture a lot, Ephesians 4 14 says that we henceforth from this day moving forward be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight, slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
The, the whole idea of this passage describes trickery. Deception and trickery through false doctrine. What, is doc, what does doctrine even mean? It means teaching. People teaching the Bible in a way that is deceptive and it tricks people into believing that it's the truth and the reality is that it isn't and the result of it is like a rudderless boat being tossed to and fro on an open ocean. I remember one time I was on a boat and the rudders broke. And we were literally adrift for for hours. We were supposed to get there in like six hours. I think it was 18 hours we were on that boat. It was just adrift. I mean, you know, they flew out some divers and they fixed it, thank God. But my point is, it was a mess. And many times people don't have direction in their life because they're not truly following after Truth. The word of truth. Mm -hmm. Titus chapter 1 verses 10 through 11 is the next one I have. I'm just giving you some scriptures. We're talking about an enemy. Whenever the servants of the man fell asleep, the enemy came and he sowed tares in the field. And we're talking about the fact that poisonous seed will produce poisonous weed. Titus 1 10 through 11. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's talking, he's talking about the fact that there were some false teachers that were saying you had to be circumcised in addition to faith in Jesus. People aren't going to tell you that today because uh, most people aren't that naive. And there's still some people that don't understand and I'm not making fun of them because they come straight out of something where they never heard anything about the Bible and they think, at first, oh, am I supposed to be circumcised? No. But what these men were doing was they were t teaching people to add something to their faith in Christ. And while men may not tell you to add circumcision to your faith in Christ, men will try to tell you that the right way to victory over sin is through what you do rather than what Jesus has already done. There's so many things that I couldn't even begin to list. <coughs> but basically, they're going to tell you things like, well, you just need to pray more. You need to go to church more. You need to be part of our recovery Bible study group. You need to journal in your journal about the things that you're going through. You need to get you a good friend and confess all your sins to him. You need to speak in tongues more. You need to, you know, study the Bible more. You need to do all of these things are godly things <coughs> as far as at least <clears throat> reading the Bible, going to church. Okay. Some of the things I listed are garbage. I'm not going to go through each one because I don't even remember what all I said. But the point is this, is that reading the Bible, going to church, praying, all of those will lead you to the truth. But how many preachers stand behind the pulpit and flip the script? Because, and we're going to get into it in a second. It's proper faith in what God provided that allows grace to flow that gives victory in the life. And these circumcision... Teachers, just like many preachers today, teach that you have to add to your faith in Christ. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that you have to hold on to your faith in Christ. Meaning it's a belief thing. I believe Jesus already did the work. Therefore, I have access to grace. Grace changes me. Amen. Grace strengthens me. Grace brings deliverance. Grace brings victory. It graces the power of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer, circumcising the heart, doing the work on the inside. Not the believer trying to clean himself up outwardly, doing a bunch of works to finally please God, but instead God doing the work in him and now it becoming manifest out of him. That's how the gospel of Jesus Christ works. Look at this last one, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, that's another way to say it. I'm begging you, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. I remember one time I told you all this before, that preacher that I used to sit under, I thought it was pretty good. He said, literally what it means is, it means, the idea is really scopio, where we get the idea of scope, to, to be able to mark them out and to see them, to put the scope on them. But he, he, com he commented, he said, how do you think that, wouldn't that be something if we walked around here and started like hitting people on the forehead with a, with a uh, can of paint, psh, 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 marking them to where when they walked around, you knew these were the people that were causing divisions. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious when he said that. People walk around with a red dot on their forehead. Division causer! There he is, everybody! Oh, 
and it would just act like, okay, <laughs> there he is, division college, I got a red dot on his head, let's go sit on the other side of the church. Anyway, I can't, I can't, that was Brad Bullock, I'm not that smart, I gotta give you credit, that was a good one, I'll never forget that one. All right. He says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses which are contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Listen, you know, what, what the Apostle Paul's talking about in the book of Romans is he's teaching all of those things that I just talked about. The difference between man trying to clean himself and fix himself outwardly through his own actions versus God doing the work inwardly based upon his faith in Christ. <clears throat> I just said in five minutes what Paul wrote in all of these chapters multiple times in his letters. But yet there's still people that do that. You think people are, have been mad at me in the past for just saying what I've said. Just think if I went around while they were standing up behind the pulpit and I went and hit them with a spray can. <laughs> They'd really be mad. Because nobody wants to be told that people aren't telling the truth. But I'm not the one that said it. Paul warned against it. Jesus warned against it. Religion is the worst. And many times people don't even realize that they're doing it. And I can tell you that there's a lot of people that have been told repeatedly, but have chosen instead to go along with what their, their boy told them. Or what they've been taught down through the years. That's right. It's hard to break away. It's hard to break away when the masses are going one way and you got, you got somebody else that's over here saying, Oh, mark them which cause divisions. They would think that you're the one causing division because you're going against what they, what they would believe. Anyway, that's another story. Listen, false doctrines come in many forms and can have multiple results in the lives of people. And I just I listed a couple on here. Um, there's the false doctrine of secret, the seeker sensitive movement that refuses to speak of sin, repentance, or the consequences of hell. That is a false doctrine. And let me tell you something. I know that I'm, people don't like it sometimes when you do this, but I've told y'all before, I read the books, I did the research, so I'm going to tell you about it. Rick Warren has had a detrimental effect on the church of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you why. He went, and you may have read his book. I've read it, some of his books. Okay? He and his people, when they started that church, went and this is what they did now. They went and knocked on people's doors in the neighborhood. And they had a checklist. What could we do to make the services at our church more comfortable for you and make it to where you would want to come in and to visit our church? And they started listing stuff. Man, get rid of the choir robes. Those are lame. Um, I don't want you to, you know, dim the lights. Personally, I don't have a problem with dim lights, but, you know, I'm just throwing some stuff out there. Dim the lights. Get some cool, you know, fluorescent lights maybe. Or, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Churches are filled. It looks like you can just Google different churches and they look like a literal concert. Okay. <laughs> You, you think that I'm trying to be hard on it, but what I'm trying to say is, is that they ask these questions. Shorten your sermon a little bit. You know, get us in and out of there. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that these weren't church folk that they were knocking on their doors. This was the world. So what they've done is in the seeker sensitive movement, they've said, this is the mindset. There are many people that are seeking. They just don't like the way we've been handling our business. Now, whenever you open up the, so what they've done is, is that they've tailored the way that they're going to run their service now to tailor towards making the world comfortable. When in reality, that wasn't the way that the gospel was supposed to be spread anyway. The way the gospel was supposed to be spread was that folks like you and folks like me that truly get saved and the, and the presence of God lives on the inside of us and the word of God that lives on the inside of us wants to come out of us. And God uses us in our friendships and in our relationships. Just not always the same, right? We've said that before. Not everybody's personality is the same. Not everybody's going to be big mouth like Matt. Not everybody's going to go on the street like Troy and Matt and hand out tracts and witness to people. And that's okay. You don't have to. Listen, you're invited to come when we go do it. But, but we still love you. Just pray for us. But God will open up doors for your neighbor. God will open up doors for the people that you work with. Amen? And you will be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But listen, 
If we can't tell people that there's a that there's a problem, that there's a sin problem, but that God has a sin solution, then we're not preaching the gospel. Amen. Amen. And so that's what I'm saying. There's a secret sensitive movement, and it doesn't want to talk about that. It wants to make me feel good, preacher. I've had people literally tell me that on multiple occasions. Man, you're just supposed to feel good when you walk out of church. And then I've also had people say, man, sometimes whenever the preacher pokes me in the eye and talks about my sin and I get my heart right with the Lord, I feel real good. Two different things. Amen? Two different things. Um, so, yeah, seeker sensitive movement that refuses to speak of those things. There's a false doctrine that focuses on the works of salvation. I'll put in here in parentheses Catholicism. You know? Catholicism teaches that people have to put, they put their faith in the works of the church. They put their faith in the church in order to be saved. Now, I realize that there's, there's a lot of Catholic people that have truly gotten saved when they've heard the true gospel. I realize that that does happen. I'm not naive. I'm not dumb. There's a lot of people that in this church that were Catholic at one point in time. How they stay in that, I don't understand it. And I'm not going to judge it because we, we hadn't got there yet. But Jesus said, don't pick them up. Don't pull the terrors out because you don't really know that, that ain't our job. Jesus said he's going to take care of that in the end. Amen. But there's also a false doctrine that focuses on works for sanctification. That's most Protestant churches. Now, all that stuff I just listed before. Go to church more. Read your Bible more. That's how they tell you that you're going to get victory. And it's a false doctrine. Because it leads you to put your faith in what you do instead of what God did. Amen. I believe this is something that I wanted to kind of say this morning. I believe there can also be a false doctrine that teaches that just a simple little prayer always equals salvation. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that I don't believe that that's always true. Amen. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 10. It says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart. I want you to see that. I want you to focus on that part right there. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe with all my heart that the key to this passage is believing with the heart. Now, when I say this, I'm not belittling the confession of the mouth. You have to confess Jesus with your mouth. But what I'm saying is, is that the believing with the heart part is something that you nor I can see. I can see you if you confess Jesus with your mouth, but I can't read your heart. I don't know what's really going on on the inside of you just any more than you know what's going on on the inside of me. There can be people that believe intellectually versus from their heart. Look at James chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Thou believest that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now, in the Greek, I got to tell you that this is kind of how this word would be spelled in, in <coughs> if you were going to spell it. Pistio. Both words are the same. Believe with the heart. The devils also believe that they tremble. Sometimes with Greek words, it's the same exact word, pistia. So how does that even happen? How does a devil get saved? A devil can't get saved. But a devil, a demon spirit, has, if you will allow me to say it this way, an intellectual capacity. What are you talking about? It, it can think. It's, it doesn't have a body like necessarily a brain like we do. But it has an awareness. How do you know that? <coughs> do you remember what the devils said whenever they saw Jesus? Son of man, you've come before the appointed time to torment us. Let us go into the swine. They, they knew who he was. They knew who he was before many of the human beings knew who he was. My point is, is that they had an awareness. They believed Jesus is the son of God. They believed that there's one God. But they can't believe unto salvation. From the heart. So the context has to do with believing and trusting one's life with the heart. 
Devils can't do that. They, they can believe cognitively just like you can believe in your intellectual capacity. Uh, 2,000 years ago, I know there's some big old words, but you get the point. Somebody told me that 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus died on two slats of wood outside a city called Jerusalem. I was just thinking maybe if I draw it out a little bit, it sounded kind of country and make it seem a little more simple. Not saying I'm going to say country folk are simple, but you get the point. It just, that's what they told me, and I just believed it. Jesus died on two pieces of wood. But just because you believed it with your head doesn't mean you believed it with your heart. Amen. When you believe it with your heart, you give your life to him, just like he gave his life for you. Amen. And when you give your life to Jesus with your heart, a miracle happens. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. I love this passage of scripture because for a couple of years now, I feel like this is what the Lord has really been putting on my heart. I believe that there's a lot of false conversions in the church. I believe there's a lot of people that pray a prayer and they think just because, oh, I prayed a prayer back in Bible school. I mean, back in vacation Bible school when I was eight years old. But there was no true transformation in their life. Once again, the preacher's not saying that it's my job to determine who did and who didn't. I'm just trying to make a point. Just because somebody prayed a prayer doesn't mean that they truly believe with their heart. But when you do believe with your heart, something happens. And this is what happens. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So what happened? You heard the word of truth. Is that anybody in here? Did you ever hear somebody speak the truth to you? All right. The gospel of your salvation. That's the truth they spoke. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed, when you believed with the heart, in whom you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What does that mean? It means that you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You heard the truth that you were a sinner. I've always used to say this a lot that, you know what, the good, the, you know what the gospel, word gospel means? It means, anybody know? Good news. Good news. But that before you can hear the good news, you got to realize there's some bad news. <laughs> bad news is man born of Adam is born a sinner. Man born of Adam without forgiveness of his sin is going to split hell wide open and spend eternity there. When you heard that bad news, but then you heard the good news that God had a remedy for sin and he sent his son Jesus and you believed it from the heart, then you were sealed with the spirit of God. Now listen to me. If you are truly born again, you know what I'm talking about. The devil might try to lie to you. He might try to whisper in your ear. He might try to tell you that you're not truly saved. But if you've been sealed by the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit has come to live on the inside of your heart, you have not been the same from that day moving forward. Amen. 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 That's the down payment. That's what he says. He said it's the earnest of our inheritance. That word earnest means down payment. Until there's coming a day when he's going to take his people home. That's going to be the final redemption. What I'm trying to tell you is it's still nothing that you nor I can see. It's the, God knows. God knows when a man or a woman truly believes from their heart. And when they do, he says, changed. Exchange took place. I took your guilt, put it on Jesus. I took his righteousness, put it on you. Amen. Conversion. Now my Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Praise God. That was uh, how did the tear get there? And basically that was point number two. And I was trying to make the point that there's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of poisonous seed that the enemy's planting, trying to cause a lot of confusion, right? Uh, but that there's a true gospel that truly changes people on the inside. And then point number three, and I'm closing with point number three, talks about, I, I titled it, Let Them Grow Together. This is how the Lord wants us to handle the tears. He wants us to focus on doing his work, the work of the ministry, teaching the truth of his word, concerning ourselves with our own walk. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the truth be told is that we all have enough inadequacies in each and every one of our own lives to keep us busy for quite some time. Praise mm -hmm. God. Instead of sitting here focusing on the failures and what everybody else does around us. Matthew chapter seven, verses one through five, Jesus talked about that. He said, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why behold you the mote 
that's like a little piece of chaff that comes off a piece of grain, little, you know, like kind of like peanut has that little husk skin on it, a little piece of that got in your eye. Why are you worried about that little speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out that little piece of chaff out of your eye, and behold, there's a beam in your own eye, you hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye, then shall you see clearly to cast out the, the little piece of chaff out of your brother's eye. The reason that I brought this up is because I think there's a danger, I'm about to say this, with the message of the cross. The danger is not with the message itself. And let me make that clear. Let me, let me repeat myself so that nobody takes me wrong. The danger isn't with the message itself. The danger is never with God or his word. The danger is with the heart of man. I'm going to get into that in a second. There's a danger with self-righteousness. There's, there, there's a danger of self-righteousness that's connected to people when they get a revelation of the message of the cross. When they first get a revelation of the message of the cross, they, they can become puffed up with pride. I, I, listen, I guarantee if you sat down with Brother Lauren Larson and you asked him, he sat down with Bob Cornell, sat down with all of them, they would, they would acquiesce or they would tell you that what Matt's telling you is the truth. I can remember sitting down at a table full of Bible students and one of their friends who wasn't even one of the Bible students made the comment, dude, we all got, we all laid up with him. He really was country. And that's exactly how I thought. We're all laid up with self-righteousness. Every last one of us, we're just full of it, full of pride. Yeah, you're right, brother. Preach it, brother. Because we, the heart of man starts to love the fact that he might know something that somebody else don't know. Oh, we got the secret knowledge now. That's, a, that's Illuminati stuff, man. We're not going to get into all that. But hey, there's a danger in self-righteousness connected to the message. But it's not the message itself. Once again, it's the heart of man. The Spirit of God desires to reveal to each individual their own heart issues. Listen, that's how the message of the cross is really supposed to work. I remember Brother Raymond Harris in, in Franklin. He's the mayor of, well, I don't know if he still is, but he was the mayor for many, many years. He was one of the Bible teachers over there. And first time I started preaching the message of the cross in Sunday school, he told me uh, the third week, he said, Brother, when you open your mouth the first two Sundays, it was like an x-ray machine in my heart. That's what the message of the cross does. The Holy Spirit is given liberty when your faith is right. It acts as a catalyst on the inside of the heart of man. There's a whole bunch of stuff in each and every one of our lives for us to be able to focus on instead of worrying about who's a tear, who's a poisonous weed, and trying to pick them out and trying to pull them out of the field of God. Jesus said, let them grow, and he's going to take care of it in the end. Listen, I wanted to explain a little bit to you about this catalyst of called grace, okay? Just give me a second. I'm about to close You have the believer, and he puts faith in a specific object, and I don't have enough room in my box, so I'm just going to write it up here, Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does that even mean? I mean, what, what does that mean? Well, real simple, and I know I've said it before, but let's keep it. Let's keep it straight. Right. When I put faith in Jesus, an exchange took place. Whether I realized it or not, I'm telling you what the Bible teaches is that I was guilty of sin. Jesus had no sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on a cross in his sinlessness. He bore my sin upon him. Now when I put faith in him and what he did for the forgiveness of my sin... And believe from my heart, God says an exchange takes place. He allows me to receive the gift of Jesus' righteousness, and he removes my guilt and condemnation off of me. Whenever that, so, so that's the object of my faith. Jesus Christ and what he did for me at the cross. When I keep my faith in that, it allows me to stay in a righteous standing with God. I understand that it's not my works that made me right. Oh, but you don't understand, preacher. I've, I've read the Bible five times. <laughs> I used to teach Sunday school at the church I used to go to. You, you see, no, it, none of that has anything to do. It doesn't matter how much work you've done. It matters That's that right. you put your faith in the work that he has already done. Amen. Yeah. 
And so, because the other is self-righteousness. All right? So, when the believer keeps faith in the right object, then guess what happens? Over here is grace. And whenever your faith is in the right object, I guess you could say it kind of opens the door to grace. And what happens is, is that grace flows back into the believer's life. Grace is like a catalyst. I don't know a whole lot about catalyst, but I'm pretty sure it's a chemistry term. And a catalyst, when you introduce it into a chemical, it changes things. Right? Grace changes things. That's the point that I'm really trying to make here. Grace changes everything. Not only will, if the message of the cross is approached properly... Will it allow grace to flow into your life to give you the victory that you need in the areas of your life? But it will also pinpoint the problems that you have in your own life. It will show you. And if one of your problems is you think you're self-righteous and you right. got to figure it out, it'll show you that one too. Yep. Unfortunately, that's one of the harder ones for people to see. Mm -hmm. Most times when people are fornicators or doing drugs or drinking, they know that they're wrong. The problem comes with the self-righteous religious spirit because he thinks he's right. And that God has a much harder time getting through that than he does the other ones. Anyway, the problem isn't with God or his word. The problem is with man's heart. Now, I will tell you that with all of these false doctrines, and one of the, one of the things that we run the risk of whenever we start to get the message, revelation of the message of the cross is that we start thinking that nobody else, we can get to the point where we literally start thinking nobody else is even saved. I've had people tell me that before. Well, do you think that they're even really saved? People that have devoted their life to the, maybe they're not. I don't know. They might be a tear, but you know what? I'm not going to sit there and start judging whether or not they're saved or not. They've devoted their whole life to the kingdom of God. And so now, because they don't believe in the Lord for sanctification the way I do, I'm going to question whether they're saved or not. That, that is a scary place for us to be. Now, at the same time, sometimes it's just true. Like, in other words, there's some folks that are preaching another Jesus. You know what I'm saying? They're preaching Jesus as Lucifer's brother. They're preaching that Jesus wasn't deity. They're pre, you know, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. They're preaching that you got to put your faith in the works of the church. That, that, I'm sorry, that's another Jesus. And so sometimes it's just true. They're preaching another Jesus. And guess what? This is what Jude said. We're closing with this. All right. Look at Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Because I had a preacher one time tell me, I don't have to defend the gospel. Well, wait, hold on a second. In other words, the gospel could take care of itself. Hmm. Hold on a second, brother. That's not what Jude, the Lord's brother, said. Jude at one time didn't even believe in his own brother. He didn't even believe that Jude was one of, was one of Mary's later sons, just like James was. And at first, they didn't even believe Jesus was really the Messiah. But this is what he writes in his letter. Behold, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, I'm telling you, I could probably preach this for quite some time, but I'm not going to do it. But this word common salvation describes to me, it doesn't just describe to me, this is what it's saying. The word there is koinonia. It means fellowship, and it's where we get the word communion. It talks about a joint participation. What Jude is trying to say is, is that there is, a, there is one type of salvation. There is one type of gospel that speaks of this one type of salvation. It's the preacher, it's the believer's job to find out what that is. Amen. And so what Jude's saying is, there's a whole, as a matter of fact, his whole letter is about false teachers. His whole letter is about false teachers. And, and what he's warning is that, that there's false teachers out there. But hey, I got to tell you something, that there's a common salvation that we've all been partaken of. And it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Which was once delivered unto the saints, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That word contend in the Greek is where we get our word agony. And it was used of Greek athletes and how they would fight 
and until the end, because back then it was a whole lot different. I mean, you know, you make a touchdown, you win at the end of the game, it was more than just spiking the ball. Like, they lost their life. If they were gladiators, the whoever lost, they lost their life. They're not do, going around doing the dance. They, they agonized and to contend, to win. And what Jude was trying to say, yes. When they talk about denying the only Lord God, are they saying that they don't even believe in God the Father? Well, he, he goes on to talk about the fact that, that they're, re, they're basically talking about false doctrine. And so it could, it could definitely meet. A lot of what was happening in the church back then had to do with Gnosticism, which believed that the body was inherently evil and couldn't be saved. And that Jesus it, it really didn't even believe that the real Jesus died on the cross, that he didn't become flesh. And so that was what they were combating back then. But it's just another flavor of some type of a false doctrine that's changing who Jesus really was. And it either denounces who he was or it denounces the work that he did. One way or the other, all false doctrine does that. So, but what Jude is saying is, is that, that these false teachers are doing that. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that while we're not supposed to pluck up tares, I guess when it's all said and done, I want to leave you with the concept of balance. We're not supposed to go around trying to pick who's a tear and who's not. Just because someone has had some failure in their life doesn't mean that they don't truly love the Lord. It's not for you nor I to judge who's really in and who's really out. But that instead, what we're supposed to do is to pray for others. We're supposed to give them the word of God with love. Amen. And at the same time, we need to be aware that God did say that everything that calls itself Christian is not necessarily Christian. And that's why it's so important that we know the truth of God's word so that we can determine whether we're hearing the truth whenever we're being taught.